Hello everyone and welcome. Today our webinar is on the exciting new features in NRF Connect SDK version 2.5.0. I am your host and speaker in today's webinar. My name is Tiago Mont and I'm a developer marketing manager here at Nordic Semiconductor. Before we get started, just a few practicalities. The webinar will have a duration of about 50 minutes with 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. Questions are highly encouraged and please type your questions on the top right sidebar on the dedicated question box. All the questions are anonymous and please uh, keep them relevant to the topics that we present during the webinar. We will then answer those questions towards the end during the dedicated Q&A section. There's also a chat box on the bottom right sidebar. That one is not anonymous, so please do not use it for questions, but feel free to chat with your, your fellow webinar participants. If you have more questions after the webinar, then DevZone is the place to go where our tech support team will be ready to support you. As usual, after the webinar, there will be a recording made available together with the presentation at webinars.nordicsemi.com slash on demand. The agenda for today will start with a short introduction to NRF Connect SDK. Then we'll have some generic updates that I want to share with you. After that, we'll have updates on development tools, including a demo of a new application called Quick Start. Then we'll continue with power management updates or PMIC, also including a demo of a new tool called NPM Power Up. We'll have some updates on Bluetooth, Wi Fi, and then we'll continue with updates on Matter, including a demo of a Matter to Bluetooth LE bridge application. And the last topic on today's webinar will be updates on Seller IoT and NRF Cloud, also with a demo on Software Center. At Nordic, exciting developers is one of our key pillars, and there's uh, several vehicles that we use to reach out to developers. We have the webinars, so that's the one we are watching right now. These are meant mostly for technology introductions and trainings. Then we have DevZone, where our tech support team is ready to provide assistance to any issues that you might have while developing your uh, applications with Nordic uh, products. Then we recently introduced uh, a new uh, single source for all of Nordic's technical documentation called Tech Talks. And we'll have uh, one slide about that during the generic update section. And last but not least, the Dev Academy, our interactive online learning platform, where you can take step-by-step uh, -step courses on various topics like the NRF Connect SDK fundamentals, uh, as well as wireless uh, specific courses such as Bluetooth LE or Cellular IoT with more topics to come in the near future. Let's continue then with the introduction to NRF Connect SDK. So NRF Connect is an umbrella term, uh, and that is, uh, refers to the ecosystem of software and tools for Nordic Semiconductor. Within that, we have, of course, the NRF Connect SDK. Then we also have the NRF Connect for desktop, which is essentially a platform that consists of several applications uh, to use with Nordic products. Some of those applications are generic in the sense that they can be used with more than one product line. Like for example, the programmer, which allows you to flash the firmware into your Nordic devices. And some other applications are more uh, wireless te technology specific, uh, like the Bluetooth Low Energy application or the cellular monitor. Then we have NRF Connect for VS Code, which is Nordic's extension for Visual Studio Code. Uh, giving you a full-fledged uh, integrated developer environment experience to develop your NRF Connect projects. And finally, we have a large portfolio of mobile applications, again, to help you uh, test and troubleshoot uh, your IoT projects. But in a nutshell, what the NRF Connect SDK is, is a single Unified code based then tool chain for all of Nordic's product lines. The NRF91 for seller, NRF70 for Wi Fi, NRF53 and 52 for Bluetooth LE and multi protocol, and also the NRF21 series, which is our front end module. The upcoming NRF54 that we have already announced, the NRF54H and the NRF54L, will also be supported in the NRF Connect SDK when they become available. And essentially the NRF Connect SDK brings you all the building blocks and all the features that you need to develop your IoT products, including 
all of the wireless protocols that will run on top of our hardware platforms. Um, and as of uh, version 2.4.0, we have a Bluetooth 5.4 qualified host and controller stack. So you can go and qualify your end products using our 5.4 listings. All right, so that was the 10,000 foot view of the NRF Connect SDK. Let's move on with some of the generic updates. And the first thing that we are very excited to share with all of you is the introduction of Tech Docs. This is Nordic's single source, single source for all technical documentation. And you'll find it at docs.nordicsemi.com. Currently, this website is in beta stage. We are still working uh, through some of the documentation porting. All of the existing content that you have on other websites, like the Info Center, for example, will stay online. But we are still checking whether we'll migrate content for some of the older products. So during this beta stage, um, all of these existing documentation websites will then stay online. And when we go into uh, moving closer into a full launch, so coming out of beta stage, uh, the existing documentation websites will eventually be retired, but there will be communication from us um, when that when we're planning to to um, retire those websites. If you want to get uh, updated, we recommend that you subscribe to our product update notifications. Uh, we have also written a Devson blog that talks a little bit more about why we are introducing this new unified documentation portal and some of the also very interesting features that you can leverage in this new portal uh, to get quicker access to the documentation and the information that you're looking for. We highly encourage you to use it as much as possible and also provide us feedback. You can do that from within the uh, Tech Talks pages themselves. There is a uh, icon on the top right for feedback and that will go directly to the team that is working on the Tech Talks project. So this is a really exciting update. And again, we're trying to uh, continue to improve all, all things related to developer experience uh, when working with Nordic products. Then moving into security topic, we have uh, announced a few months back that uh, PSA level two certification has been achieved for the NRF 5340 and the NRF 9160. So PSA level two certification, what it does is that it verifies protection against scalable remote software attacks, and it includes um, a independent verification. So it is independently tested by a security evaluation lab, which is riskier in our case, and that includes 25 days of white box evaluation. The PSA level two certifications for the 5340 and 9160 are available on the PSA website. So if you want to certify your end device um, um, with a PSA certification, you can use the certificates from one of our products and those will be, can be inherited uh, to be used in your final uh, certification for your end device. And the last update uh, within the generic updates topic is about Amazon Sidewalk. We actually covered Amazon Sidewalk on the previous webinar. Uh, that included also a demo showing data being exchanged between a Sidewalk device and a AWS Cloud. So um, at that time, the that Amazon Sidewalk uh, had to be used with NRF Connect SDK 2.2, and it was available separately. Now it has been integrated in NRF Connect SDK. Uh, but what this means exactly is that we now support uh, Sidewalk as a regular NRF Connect SDK component, like for example, Matter. Uh, it, it is not available by default when you install the NRF Connect SDK. You still need to install it separately, uh, but it will now be following the uh, planning and maintenance cycles of the NRF Connect SDK releases. The reason to have it installed separately and not have it by default as part of the NRF Connect SDK installation has to do with the stricter Amazon license. So we have, for example, some uh, customers and partners that redistribute the NRF Connect SDK. And if the Amazon Sidewalk was part of the NRF Connect SDK package, they would also be redistributing Amazon Sidewalk, which is something that the Amazon license doesn't allow. And for that reason, uh, customers who want to use Amazon Sidewalk will have to become um, 
acquainted with the license and will have to make that installation separate uh, to the NRF Connect SDK. Um, we also have a few updates compared to uh, what we had on the last webinar. So now both NRF uh, 52840 and NRF 5340 SOCs are supported. So that is for Bluetooth LE transport. For example, for devices that you have you know, within the home that are uh, within radio range of a, a sidewalk gateway. But then we also have support for the Semtech uh, transceiver for uh, longer uh, distances using a subject a subgig transport, uh, LoRa and GFSK uh, modulation. Uh, just one final note uh, before we move to the next topic is that Amazon Sidewalk is currently only available in the US. And now moving on to some updates on Nordic's development tools. And the first thing to share here ha is in NRF Connect for VS Code. So in NRF Debug, uh, there used to be, oh, well, there is a feature that used to be called Memory Viewer. And now that has been renamed to Memory Explorer. The reason why we've done that is that now it allows you to write directly into the memory from the user interface. So as you can see here on this animation, you can click on any given byte and just um, once you've selected the byte you want to edit, you click on the little um, uh, pencil icon and that allows you to start overriding uh, the memory in those locations and moving forward. So let's say that, for example, you uh, want to update certain variables um, directly in RAM, like for example, a counter or a sensor value. That's something you can now easily do from within the Memory Explorer uh, feature in NRF Connect for VS Code. Then the other addition is that you can add custom memory sections as additional tabs. Uh, we don't have an animation here for that, but essentially you could go to this plus arrow and then indicate a memory section that you want to have on that tab. So you could have a little bit more focus to certain memory sections where you have, for example, some important buffers or important data that you want to is easily sort of glance at during your development. So let's say that you wanted to look at the memory uh, between you know, the address uh, 2 followed by a bunch of zeros to 2000002C. You could create um, then a uh, custom tab and you would say, okay, I want this tab to show the memory between these two addresses. And that would give you focus into those two sections. And then the last thing is that you can also copy uh, data from the uh, Memory Explorer and then copy it you know, wherever you might need it. If you copy it um, from where you see the, the raw data, you'll copy it as raw bytes. But if you have the ASCII visualization uh, enabled, you can also copy it as ASCII characters as an alternative. Then uh, we have also integrated uh, both the toolchain and the SDK management into the extension. Uh, you can still uh, use the toolchain manager, but by having this within NRF Connect for VS Code, it really simplifies the setup and configuration by giving you a you know, single consistent user interface. So you don't need to be uh, switching between applications. You can do everything from within NRF Connect for VS Code. One thing that this gives you that the Toolchain Manager uh, doesn't give access to is that you can also download the main branch if you want to you know, stay updated with the latest developments. However, we strongly uh, you know, do not recommend using the main branch for production. If there's some experimental feature that you really want to test, go ahead and do that, but use one of the tagged releases if you're working on production code. Uh, the Toolchain Manager will continue to be available and maintained from Nordic. So this will still be out there as an alternative to installing the SDK and the Toolchain. Then we also have some updates on NRF Util version 7.6.0. For those who may not be familiar with NRF Util, it's a unified command line utility for Nordic products. So it has two new commands available. One is the Toolchain Manager. So in addition to being able to install the toolchain uh, and the SDK through the toolchain manager application, graphical application, NRF Connect for desktop, and installing it through um, NRF Connect for VS Code, you also have a command line option, which is part of NRF Util. So you can manage, configure the NRF Connect SDK and the toolchain. And actually this is the backend for both the toolchain manager, so the GUI application in NRF, NRF Connect for desktop, 
as well as the NRF Connect SDK for VS Code. In addition to that, you have the BLE sniffer. So this is um, to use the Bluetooth Low Energy Sniffer for Nordic Semiconductor devices. And one final note is that the NRF Util 4 NRF 5 SDK, which was the predecessor of the new NRF Util, uh, has now been marked deprecated. So the new NRF Util is really becoming a platform for commands. All of the commands from, uh, from NRF Util for NRF 5 SDK are available in the new NRF Util. So you can start using the new one and you will have access to the exact same features that you used to have there. And the last application uh, to mention here and the development tools update is a quick start. So this is an application that is meant to give you a little bit faster and, and a smoother getting started experience. So as you can see, it's sort of a step uh, through uh, sequence and we'll have a demo uh, on this uh, just after the slide. Essentially a bit of a guided path, uh, taking you, you know, through the evaluation where you can flash a sample, which tools are recommended to install and all the way to getting yourself up and running with a development environment. Uh, currently we are supporting the NRF 9160 development kit, uh, but we uh, plan to expand this into other kits as well. So let's go and have a quick demo of this new application. All right, so I have here NRF Connect for desktop and I will go and open the quick start application. So the first thing it does is it tries to detect whether I have a kit connected to my computer. So I have a NRF 9160 DK. So I'll go ahead and select that. So we're in this initial connection uh, stage of the quick start. I've selected my kit and I'll go and continue just minimize this one here so we reduce some distractions there first it gives you some information about the kit and what you sort of can do with it the technology is supported some links to some of the documentation then um, it gives you the uh, two different options you have to develop with internet 9160 so one which is the recommended is that you use you know both cores as it have uh, it has a dedicated modem core and then a separate application core so you can run your application on the device, but you can also use it as a modem only, which is a more classical approach to cellular development uh, where you have uh, 80 command interface to the 9160 and you use it only as a uh, modem device. So we'll continue. Then we have the chance to rename our device. I already have a custom name for, for my device, so I won't go and do that. You can add whatever name you want to have there. So I'll just uh, continue this one. Then uh, you can flash um, a sample. So you can flash the uh, AT command sample, the asset tracking, uh, which gives you um, access to your location of your device or the shell command line interface. Um, I have to flash something. So I'll go with the AT commands and it will flash both the modem core as well as the application core. And these are also hyperlinks. So this will take you to the um, modem firmware 1.3.3 download page where you can read you know, the release notes and change log and get some more details about the features in this firmware version. And the serial LTE modem will take you to the um, documentation page where you can read more about how the sample uh, works uh, and how to test it. So the modem core is the first one that gets updated um, and then the application core will get flashed with the, uh, with the new sample. All right, modem core is done. Now application core and we've reset the device. So the device is ready to be used. We continue um, and then it automatically verifies uh, the manufacturer hardware version and the email number. If we go here and click on verify, it will send the necessary AT commands to get that information back. And it also gives you the option to copy the email number if you need to use it, for example, for any kind of fault provisioning uh, as an example. Then we continue, um, it gives you uh, some options uh, to start evaluating, uh, activating your, your SIM card, uh, opening the serial terminal, which is another application within NRF Connect for Desktop. Also opening Cellular Monitor. We had a demo on the Cellular Monitor on the previous SDK webinar. So if you want to know more about that one, I recommend that you go and watch that. So we'll just continue on the quick start path. 
and then it takes you to a more uh, let's say developer oriented uh, guidance uh, where you can um, you know install uh, VS Code and the extension and also the command line utilities that are necessary to to develop. I already have these installed uh, in my uh, in my laptop, so I'll go ahead and skip that. Then uh, it uh, hints you uh, towards the Developer Academy, where we have a course on Seller IoT. So we highly recommend that, uh, especially if you are getting started with Seller IoT, that you go and take that course, uh, and also a white paper on best practices for Seller IoT development. And then it recommends some uh, additional applications in NRF Connect for desktop. I have all of those installed already, uh, but if I didn't, then you would have the option to install them from here. And in this case, it recommends to install the Seller Monitor, the Power Profiler. So this is the app that you use to control the Nordic Power Profiler kit to get the power consumption measurements. Uh, then the Programmer, so you can flash uh, the, the SOCs and the Serial Terminal uh, as well. And after that, we are done. Um, this getting started flow, uh, we are also open to, to feedback, so you can help us improve. So you can give feedback directly from this application uh, if you write into this text box uh, and then give feedback. I won't be doing that. And this is, yeah, this is how the quick start works. If you're getting started, obviously this is now the recommended path for seller with other kits uh, to come in the near future. All right, moving now into power management or PMIC updates. First thing is that we have a new application in NRF Connect for desktop called NPM Power Up. This application now allows you to easily control and configure the NPM 1300. And you can then also export your configuration as a overlay file that you can import into a NRF Connect SDK project. And we'll have a quick demo uh, in just a few minutes. Some of the experimental features uh, that were added on the previous SDK are now supported. So that means that now the NPM 1300 and the NPM 1300 evaluation kit are supported, as well as the features of charger, bugs, LDOs, load switches, and GPIOs. In this release of NRF Connect uh, SDK 2.5, we have now also expanded the feature support uh, with uh, LEDs, uh, ship mode, hibernate, and reset. We have added more charger configurations, including JITA, which is essentially a set of guidelines on, on battery charging and uh, trickle charging. Trickle charging means when you charge the battery with the same current that is uh, the self-discharge current, so essentially keeping a, a battery uh, fully charged. Uh, we have also added then support for watchdog and event handling. We recently had a webinar on NPM 1300, so I highly recommend you to watch that if you want to learn more about this product. And now let's have a quick demo on the NPM Power Up application. So let's get started with our NPM uh, Power Up uh, demo. So, uh, well, first of all, I will uh, show you the setup that I have, at least the first setup. Um, so I have the NPM 1300 evaluation kit. And then I have a LiPo battery connected to it. I also have a USB connected for the, um, for the to give power to the PMIC. And I have a second USB um, connected to the NPM controller port. So this one is connected to the N, um, NRF 5340 SOC, which acts as the host to the NPM 1300 in the right in the middle of the evaluation kit. This one here is not providing power. This one is providing communication to the NPM power up application. So I'll go here to NRF Connect for Desktop and open NPM Power Up. Select my device and connect to it. And okay, we are in sync. So in the dashboard, we have some of the uh, so let's say most common functionalities that you will be you know more most likely to to want to evaluate and and, and test with. So we have the bug converters, the load switches, uh, the fuel gauge, and the charger. Then you have some additional tabs that give you a little bit more focus into each of these sort of uh, functionality group. So on the charger, you also get the JITA compliance uh, configuration. It's already uh, set by default to follow the guidelines. Then you have the regulators in here, but the two bug converters, load switches, which can be configured as LDOs, uh, GPIO and LED control, uh, some of these system features like timer, power failure, uh, warning, and so on. Um, you also have the option to profile your battery with a, an additional board that's going to be available quite soon. 
Uh, but that's something that, that will not be part of this demo. But if you were to profile your battery, um, then those projects would show up uh, in this tab. Then you have the graph. So this is the battery data, the voltage, current, temperature, state of charge. And if you want to provide a feedback on this tool, uh, feel free to do so. We highly encourage that. And at the end, you have uh, just a little bit more information, including a, a link to DevZone and a way to create a system report. So you can attach that to your uh, tech support request and you know enable our team to have a little bit more data to work with. Okay, so if we go to the dashboard, uh, first thing we'll do is uh, you know charge the battery so we can see what, what happens there. So for this battery, I need to increase the termination voltage a little bit more, 4.2, and let's put the charging current at roughly 400 milliamps. So we'll go ahead and enable that and then move over to the graph. And as we can see here, the current uh, goes into negative 400. So negative because it's flowing into the battery, not out of the battery. So when it's in the, the positive space, that means that the current is flowing out of the battery. When it's in the negative space, it's flowing into the battery. So it's charging, you know, as expected. If we go to the dashboard, we can see here that the fuel gauge starts trying to calculate the time to full. It gives us a state of charge uh, estimate uh, as well. So um, then uh, let's see what happens when we're trying to discharge the battery. So if we just disable the charger, um, uh, buck converter, buck one, we can increase that to 3.3 volts and we enable the load switch, uh, which puts a 47 ohm resistor um, you know, in, in line with the, with the load switch. Then we can go here to the graph and we can see that the current is zero. This is zero because I still have the uh, power USB cable connected to the kit. So if I go back to my kit, so this cable here is still connected. But if I pull that one out, then we can see that uh, then the current starts flowing out of the battery instead because the power cable is no longer there. So now we have about 74 milliamps coming out uh, from the battery. All right, uh, so now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, put my uh, hardware engineer hat on and you know I've just you know made my final PIM configuration. Actually, I want the charger to be enabled as part of that configuration and this to be disabled. So this is my configuration. Uh, now I want to sort of translate this into my you know, colleague who's doing the, the embedded firmware development. Uh, normally this would, you know, imply that you would have to revert back to the documentation and sort of give some register data that they would have to put into the registers. With the NPM power up, we're trying to solve that problem very easily by being able to export this configuration into a file that can be just imported into an NRF Connect SDK project. So if I go here to export uh, configuration, what I can do is that uh, I can create an overlay file. Uh, I already have one that I created, so I'll just use the same one, overwrite that, and I'll do save, okay, place that. And uh, now we don't need NP up, NPM power up anymore. So I'll go and close that. And I'm going to change my setup a little bit. So now I'm going to bring a, a second board, uh, which is the NRF52 uh, DK. And this is going to act uh, as the, uh, the host to my NPM uh, 1300 device. So I'll just go and replicate what I'm showing on the screen here. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to run um, the fuel gauge sample, which is uh, in, the, uh, in the SDK. All right, so as you can see here, um, I have disconnected the NPM controller cable, so I'm not uh, having uh, any, any, any communication with the PC through the NPM 1500. And instead, I've connected the um, NRF52DK to the, to the laptop, and I've connected the STA, uh, SCL pins, uh, ground, and VDD IO for reference. The fuel gauge uh, sample documentation, you can find it in the EarthConnect SDK documentation under samples, PMIC samples, and PM1300 fuel gauge. Um, scroll a little bit up. So these are all the boards that you can use it with. I'm using the NRF52DK. Then you have the, the wiring explained uh, very um, very well in this, in this table here. So I've done the connection between these pins between the EK and the NRF52DK. And then once we uh, flash and run this application, what we're going to get in the COM port is this information. So we'll get battery voltage, current, temperature, state of charge, time to empty, and time to full. So uh, let's go over to my, my VS Code. So I've already uh, created uh, the sample. I've already flashed it uh, to, my, to my device. And um, I will just go uh, and open the COM port. Expand that. 
And let's reset. Okay, there we go. So what do we have here? Um, those are the information that was mentioned in documentation. So we have the battery voltage, we have the current. So I have the power USB cable connected. So I'm charging the battery at this point. The temperature, state of charge, time to empty, time to full. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to bring in that overlay file. Uh, so I'll just uh, close this one. I don't need this one anymore. Bring this over, drop it over. Okay. So this is the file that we got as the output of the NPM power up uh, when we export it. So it has the configurations for the for the box, LDOs, etc. Uh, then this is the part that we're interested in, the charger configuration. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to use this overlay file to change um, the um, the current uh, that's being used or the, the the limit of the current that's being used to charge the battery. So the on the default um, from the sample is about 150 milliamps. We are going to charge it about 400 milliamps. There is a bug that we're going to fix in NPM power up. So it gives us three extra zeros. That's a little bit too much. It will be 404 amps. We don't want that. We want 404 milliamps. So I took those three zeros away. And we're also going to remove this JADA compliance portion so that it's a bit easier for the fuel gauge algorithm. OK, so we have our overlay file that came from NPM power up. Now we need to go into our project build configuration and add the overlay file. So that will be automatically uh, discovered by our extension. We just select it from the dropdown, click OK, and build configuration. So now it needs to build uh, the whole project. Uh, in the meantime, we can see that um, this is what we, uh, our, our firmware continues to run on the NRF52DK. If I were to uh, remove uh, the USB cable, you can see that in this case, we wouldn't be charging anymore. So the current goes from, from minus to plus. I know it's drawing a little bit of current from the battery uh, through the PMIC. But if I put it back, you'll see that uh, it goes back into the charging. And let's look at our uh, build status. OK, uh, it takes still uh, maybe a few more seconds before we're ready to flash it. So once we're done with the build, we're going to flash this new firmware, which is essentially fuel gauge plus the overlay that came from NPM power up, plus those two small modifications we made. And that will go then into the NRF52DK and run as a new firmware. OK, build is complete. So let's go ahead and flash. And let's open our VCOM here. So now it's paused because it's flashing new firmware. When it comes back up, we should see that the charging current is will be higher because we've changed that configuration. OK, there we go. So we used to have about 127 milliamps. Now we have 344 milliamps. So it's closer to the configuration that came from the NPM power up export. OK, so this is the end of our demo. Um, just wanted to show how easy it is to configure the NPM 3300 PMIC with our tools and also how easy it is to sort of um, you know, exchange it between hardware and software engineer to make sure those configurations get absorbed into your firmware as easy as possible with you know, minimum friction uh, and maximum efficiency. All right, thanks for the demo. I hope you've enjoyed it. And let's continue with the, web with the uh, webinar. All right, so moving now to a short update on Bluetooth. So starting with Bluetooth uh, Low Energy, or LE, uh, the first thing is that LE Power Control Request Procedure. So this is a feature that we introduced in NRF Connect SDK 2.2.0, so a few releases ago. It was introduced as experimental, and now with 2.5.0, it is supported. We have also introduced experimental support for isochronous channels both SIS, so connected isochronous streams, and BIS, which means broadcast isochronous streams. That uh, experimental support was added to the soft device controller. So essentially, we're starting to bring uh, some of the functionality that is required for LE audio into the soft device controller. Then on Bluetooth Mesh, we have added support for network lighting controls, or NLC. And what this is, is a set of Bluetooth mesh profiles uh, for standardized wireless lighting control. So essentially, it defines a common language for wireless uh, lighting controls using Bluetooth mesh so that devices in the lighting control space uh, can uh, be interoperable between different vendors. And we also had uh, recently a webinar about NLC. So if you're interested in this topic, I recommend to go and watch that one.
And then uh, to wrap up on Bluetooth, the Bluetooth Mesh 1.1 features that were included in NRF Connect SDK 2.4 as experimental, so in the previous release, they are now supported. And that was covered in the uh, NRF Connect SDK 2.4.0 webinar, uh, including uh, some details on the functionality of those features. So I include that, um, sorry, I recommend that you go and watch that one if you are interested in learning a little bit more. So moving on with uh, Wi-Fi updates. First thing is that we added support uh, for a uh, enhanced Wi-Fi scan API. So this gives you a little bit more, uh, you know, a few more knobs. Uh, so it gives you optimizations and more uh, configurability um, to, you know, sort of tweak the Wi-Fi scanning functionality on the NRF 70 series devices. So you can choose, you know, passive active scanning, different channels, and and various other um, configurations. So you can find that sweet spot between performance and power consumption. We have uh, also added a network agnostic connectivity manager. So this basically allows that you can uh, use any IP-based protocol uh, in a seamless way, uh, independent of the underlying transport. So whether you're using you know, cellular, IoT, or Wi-Fi, so they both support IP-based communication. Uh, this connectivity manager gives you that uh, abstraction so that you, you can write the same application and then run it on either Wi-Fi or cellular. Some of our samples are using this, like for example, if you look at the MQTT sample, you can build it either for cellular IoT or Wi-Fi target uh, because it's based on this uh, network agnostic connectivity manager, which allows you to decouple your application running on top of IP from what's uh, beneath that and get that decoupling so you can support you know, more scalable and flexible um, uh, targets. Then we have um, added support to the NRF 7000 and 2DK on some uh, existing samples, the ones listed here. Uh, these are in the NRF Connect SDK on the um, NRF section. Uh, also, a uh, selection of these after networking samples are now also supported by the NRF 7000 and 2DK. And we have also added some new samples, um, Wi-Fi TWT, so the target wait time, uh, one of the Wi-Fi 6 um, functionalities that brings uh, lower power to Wi-Fi uh, wi stations by allowing them to sleep for, for longer. Then we have the Wi-Fi uh, shutdown sample and the Wi-Fi WFA quick track control application. So this uh, WFA stands for Wi-Fi Alliance. So this is an application that helps you uh, go through the uh, Wi-Fi Alliance certification. We have also made uh, some significant improvements on memory utilization. In this case, it's the memory utilization for scanning only applications. Like for example, if you're using Wi-Fi uh, for locationing, where you're only scanning for Wi-Fi SSID uh, access points, and we have there reduced the RAM usage from 55 kilobytes to 20 kilobytes. And now some updates on Matter. Uh, yeah, similarly to those improvements on, on Wi-Fi, we have also made some significant improvements on on Matter when it comes to memory utilization. So for the matter over thread template application, um, we have uh, gotten a reduction in flash and RAM for the uh, on the debug build. The reduction was 69 kilobytes, so we went from 884 kilobytes to 815, and we've been able to reduce 56 kilobytes of RAM. On the release build, uh, 17 kilobytes um, of reduction in flash and 54 kilobytes reduction in RAM. Then on the uh, analogous sample uh, for matter over Wi-Fi, so the matter over Wi-Fi template application, we've gotten a reduction of 17 kilobytes of flash, 158 kilobytes of RAM, so this is quite significant, and then eight kilobytes of flash on the release build and 156 kilobytes of RAM. We have also added experimental support for matter bridge application. So what this does is that it bridges between uh, matter and non-matter devices. So this application specifically bridges between matter and Bluetooth LE devices. So the way this works is that you'll have your matter network uh, and then you'll have non-matter devices. So in this image, uh, you know, it's a B just for illustration purposes, but it could essentially be anything, Bluetooth LE, you know, and other non-matter, non-IP protocols. And then you'll have your matter uh, bridge um, making sure or allowing for these non-matter devices to be part of your matter network and be controlled as if they were matter devices. So this brings a huge benefit to consumers because when they're starting to purchase you know, matter uh, devices, it allows them to keep their existing non-matter devices. 
and they can use those together with their matter devices. So they don't have to sort of, you know, buy all matter devices and, you know, uh, let go of their existing devices. They can coexist as part of, uh, of one uh, matter network using this uh, bridging uh, functionality. And yeah, our matter team um, has made a really cool demo that we're going to watch uh, right now. In the NRF Connect SDK 2.5.0, we delivered a new bridge application uh, that allows to expose devices uh, that use Bluetooth LE uh, to the Matter fabric. Uh, on my desk, I have NRF 7002 DK running Matter bridge application uh, and two Bluetooth LE peripherals running uh, LED button service and environmental sensing profile samples. Uh, these are pure Bluetooth LED devices that do not have access to Matter. Uh, so I'm going to make it possible uh, thanks to the bridge device. Uh, the LBS uh, will be represented as lighting device uh, and ESP will be represented uh, using temperature and humidity sensors. Uh, so I call it uh, weather station. Uh, I have here also two commercial ecosystems, uh, Google Home and Amazon Alexa. Uh, to present the uh, support for bridging in ecosystems is really good. Uh, I have already commissioned the bridge device to both ecosystems uh, using multi-fabric feature. Um, and you can see uh, it is visible in both applications uh, as NRF bridge uh, device. But for now, there are no other devices connected to the bridge. Uh, let's add new devices using bridge uh, device shell. So first I type matter bridge scan command to see uh, what devices are available. Uh, in the meantime, please take a look at the UI of the, the DK. Uh, there is LED1 that is blinking to show the firmware is running. Uh, the LED2 uh, that shows the Bluetooth connection status. Now it's off because it's not connected. And the LED3 uh, that presents status of the light. Uh, okay, the output uh, shows there are two devices that I have on my desk. Let's first add uh, the LBS device. Okay, uh, the device was added. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you can see it is visible in both applications. Uh, I can control it using the app, for example, uh, turn it on using Alexa, hmm? and turn it off uh, using Google Home. Okay, I can also use voice commands, uh, for example, Alexa, turn on the kitchen light. Okay. Or, hey Google, turn off the kitchen light. Sure, turning the kitchen underscore light off. Okay, uh, let's now add the weather station device. Uh, so the device number is uh, zero, and let's call it uh, weather station. Uh, you can see uh, the device is visible in both applications. Uh, in the Google app, it presents temperature and humidity results, and the Amazon app presents only temperature uh, results as humidity uh, sensor is not yet supported. Uh, similarly, we can ask for temperature. Uh, Alexa, what is the temperature of weather station? The weather underscore station temperature is 22.45 degrees. Hmm. Hey Google, what's the temperature in my room? It's currently 23 degrees. Hmm. That's it. Uh, happy bridging of your devices to matter. All right, so let's move to the last uh, topic in today's webinar, Seller IoT updates. So we have a few new supported samples uh, for cellular. Uh, one uh, is called cellular battery, and it shows how to obtain the battery information from the modem using AT commands. And then there's another one called NRF device provision. So this one is a lot more interesting, and it shows you how you can use the um, NRF cloud provisioning service that we have on the NRF cloud side uh, to use that with your cellular IoT device. So if you want to do provisioning of devices in the field, 
this is this is a sample that <clears throat> shows you how you can go ahead and do that. Then we also have a a, um, a new version of the modem firmer um, modem firmer version one point three point five. Uh, this has been available since uh, June this year. Uh, the biggest update is that we now support um, the TLS 1.2 connection identifier extension. So what this gives you, um, and I'll, I'll show you uh, in a bit more detail in the next slide, uh, but the benefit here, the, big, the biggest benefit is that it can uh, significantly reduce the power consumption when you're using uh, secure connections with protocols like uh, CoAP, where you don't uh, maintain a connection active, so it will time out. Uh, so then you don't need to do the the handshake uh, when you try to communicate back with your with your cloud. Um, this is also supported on the NRF cloud side, uh, both co-op and the connection identifiers feature. And we have a DevZone blog that talks a little bit more about that and also has a power consumption um, a power consumption comparison between a co-op and MQTT. So, but the, how does this actually work, this connection identifier? So in a nutshell, if you would have uh, a system where you don't have a connection identifier, so you would have your, your device and uh, NRF Cloud uh, talking to each other. So initially there would be a, the, the handshake and then they would you know, exchange messages, have the acknowledgements. And at some point your device would go into sleep. So it would spend a certain amount of time not communicating back with the cloud. During that time, uh, there would be a, a timeout uh, activity and the connection would, would close. So when you have more data that you want to send back to the cloud, you need to do this DTLS handshake again. And this is a significant you know, power consumption penalty each time you have to do that. So each time you want to send data back to the cloud, uh, secure data, you need to do this handshake. So that's you know, in a way wasting energy if you wouldn't have to do that. On the right-hand side represents a system where you do have connection identifier. So it's a little bit different here. So you do start uh, doing the handshake. So the first time that you communicate with your cloud, you exchange your data, and then you go into your sleep mode. But then what happens is that uh, because you have this connection identifier stored on both sides, then when you wake up and you send more data, you don't need to do uh, the handshake anymore. So you use this connection, connection identifier uh, feature to skip that step and start sending data straight away. So this gives you a significant power consumption uh, benefit um, compared to not having uh, this feature in place. And the last feature in, in Seller, and the actually the most relevant feature is that we are very, very excited to introduce support for software sim. This is a revolutionary feature, which now allows using a purely software-based uh, sim solution. Uh, that will run on the secure processing environment in the NRF uh, 91 series. So this will be isolated from the application through ARM Trust Zone. It runs on the application processor, but it has a, a separate isolated area uh, where it will run. So you know, we're looking at sims from a historical perspective, we used to have you know the, the most recent physical sims were the the Core FF, also known more, more commonly as the the Nano uh, sims. So this is the one that we use in. Uh, most smartphones, then we go into more integrated solutions that go into the um, inside the devices. And now we have pure software solutions. So the the two, uh, you know, the biggest benefits here, uh, number one is the reduction in power consumption, because when you have a, a physical SIM, there is some uh, power consumption associated uh, with that device. And then of course, the second benefit is that it really simplifies your design. Uh, you can make more compact designs by removing the need of having a physical SIM. And of course, that brings also lower hardware costs. And overall, it's of course a um, much more um, you know, um, friendly solution when it comes to environmental impact. You have less material going into your device, less plastic, less devices being shipped around the world when you have a pure software implementation. Uh, as of now, Onomondo has what they call the soft SIM solution that is available today to any Nordic customer. So if you're interested in, in using this solution, uh, reach out to Onomondo to learn more about what they have to offer. And as I mentioned, this is supported on all the NRF91 series devices. So that means the NRF9160 device, which is the device we have currently in production, uh, as well as the uh, upcoming devices that we announced uh, back in, in June, the NRF9161 uh, and the NRF9131. Right, and now that we have introduced the soft sim or software sim, uh, we also have a demo that highlights uh, the power consumption benefit.
In NREF Connect SDK version 2.5, we introduced a software sim interface through our modem library for the first time, which means that you can run software sims on our NREF 91 series. The first company to support this feature on our devices is Onomondo. Their soft sim solution is now commercially available and anyone that wants to test this can do it now. Just google NREF 9160 soft sim and the top page should bring you to Onomondo's landing page. There you can get a free trial of the soft sim and read the guide on how to initialize it on our NREF 91 series. We are now going to look at a quick comparison of running our UDP sample on our NREF 91 60DK. Where the device will wake up, send a UDP packet and then the modem goes into RC idle mode. And then into extended DRX intervals listening to the network. It's in EDRX where we really see the benefits of using a soft sim. Let's look at the measurements when using a physical sim card. It is in between these EDRX intervals where the physical sim goes into something called clock stop mode. For physical sims, they can use quite a lot of current consumption in this idle mode. We can see that the average current consumption between the paging time windows are 60 micrograms. Let's now test with Onomondo's soft sim. Here we can see a big difference between the paging time windows. Now we can see that the average current consumption is 4.4 micrograms. That is a 92% reduction in current consumption when using a soft sim. Whether you're looking into reducing cost, size of the final design, or reducing power consumption, try out a software based sim in your next NRF91 project. All right, so that was all the updates we had to share with you today. So we've reached the end of our webinar. Uh, we encourage you to sign up for our, our webinars at webinars.norixam.com. Uh, if you haven't yet explored the Academy, highly recommend you uh, to take some of the courses there, You know whether you're just getting started or even if you're already an experienced developer uh, with Nordix products, uh, you can do so at academy.norixam.com. Uh, if you need tech support, the place to go is DevZone at devzone.nordicsemi.com. And for general information about Nordics products and services, you can visit our main website, nordicsemi.com. And let's move on to the Q&A and let's take some of the questions that have been coming in during the webinar. All right. Thank you, everyone who joined today. So uh, before we go to the questions, I would just like to run two very quick polls. Uh, ask you guys, um, how would you rate the webinar content? One to five, one being worst, five uh, being best. And then a uh, second poll, how would you rate the webinar demos? Uh, same rating, one to five. Uh, oops, uh, I need to wait for the first poll to 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 close before um before i run the second one so if you could just go ahead and answer the the first poll in the meantime i'll start taking some of the uh questions go here to the question box uh so the first question is when will the uh course for wi-fi be available on the academy the answer is very soon uh, without giving too too many uh, specifics but it should be coming quite soon there uh, do you plan to release uh, LTS version of uh, Nerf Connect SDK, so LTS long-term support? Uh, this is something we are looking at, but we don't have uh, any information to share there uh, just yet. Then another question, what is the best way of updating an already installed version of NRF Util? So you can do this from NRF Util itself. There's a command self-upgrade. So if you run that command, it will update the main installation of the NRF Util. Then you can update these separate commands uh, through their own uh, commands uh, update. Uh, when will Thing United One be supported by the Quick Start application? Uh, we're aiming to have this uh, during first quarter of uh, 2024, so first quarter next year. Still on the Quick Start, when will the um, NRF 54? 340 audio DK be supported. Uh, on this one, we currently don't, don't have plans. 
uh, but also do keep in mind that uh, LD audio as such is still uh, experimental status. Uh, another question, uh, if I flash modem firmware uh, with the new NRF connect, will I get on a Mondo soft some support in the modem? So um, you will need a minimum uh, modem firmware version 1.3.5 and the latest NRF connect 2.5.0. That gives you access to the software SIM interface. Uh, and then you can yeah, use the soft SIM solution from Onomondo. You'll get uh, that. You need a, a separate repository for that. And then you also need the uh, soft SIM uh, profiles uh, from Onomondo. Uh, but if you, um, yeah, you can learn more on the link that uh, my colleague Martin posted on the chat. And the link is also on the soft SIM slide from the handouts, which will be available after the webinar. Um, let me just pause and look at the poll. OK, I'm going to close the, <clears throat> the first poll. And I will open now the second poll. Uh, how would you rate the webinar demos? Uh, one being worst and five being best. And going back to the to the questions. Um, okay, continuing. So, do I need to uninstall an old version of an RF Connect before installing a new one? I'm assuming this is an RF Connect for desktop, based on when the question came during the quick start demo. Uh, no, you don't need to uninstall the old version. So you can just uh, update the existing version. There will be a um, there will be a warning in the application telling you that there's a new version available and you can update the one you have. Uh, do you plan to add support for Zuri IoT hub connection over open thread? So far, samples use Wi Fi or seller. Uh, no plans on this as of now. Uh, this is a bit of a roadmap item, so not something we normally comment on the webinars. Um, is soft AP supported on NRF 7002? It's not supported today, but this is something that we want to add uh, in the future sometime next year. Uh, can we use NRF 9161 without IP communication to the base station? Uh, there is a feature called non-IP data delivery, um, but I don't think it's very widely supported. Uh, so that's something um, I would recommend to follow up on this question on DevZone, and our tech support team can give a little bit more insight into that. Uh, is SoftSim also working on older NRF 9160 hardware? Yes, it works across all the NRF 91 series. So we had that on the slide, including, so this includes the NRF 9160, uh, 61, and uh, 31, which are the two upcoming products that we announced a few months ago. Uh, when will LE Auto profiles be added to the SDK? Uh, we don't have uh, date for this yet. So as I mentioned, LE Audio is still an experimental status. Um, so that is will come uh, a little bit later. Can I switch from soft SIM to physical one? Yes, actually, you can have both. Uh, you can use either soft SIM as your primary and the physical SIM as a backup or vice versa. So they're not, this is not a mutually exclusive option. You can uh, have both at the same time and, and then make that decision on your application. Um, does the software SIM store data to the NRF application flash? Is there a risk that using a non-software SIM sample overrides SIM data? I'm not exactly sure. So, I mean, using the soft SIM uh, definitely has a footprint in terms of uh, flash and RAM needs. Uh, I don't think there is a risk of having the data overwritten, uh, but this is probably a question that I recommend uh, following up on the uh, on DevZone with the tech support team. Uh, this was the last question, if you came uh, when we started the Q&A. So I'll go ahead and now close the poll. And it seems that we don't have any more questions coming. So thanks, everyone who joined. Uh, we also have the evening session. So if you want to join that or, or ask a question later on, feel free to do so. And yeah, thanks for coming. And um, see you again on the next SDK release sometime next year. Bye. All right, thank you everyone for joining today. So we have a few questions that came in. Uh, before I answer those, I'm just going to um, throw a poll here. Uh, how would you rate the webinar content? Uh, rating one to five, one being worst and five being best. And uh, while you guys answer that poll, I'll start answering um, some, of the, some of the questions. Um, so the first question, uh, I need to be able to get a configuration of things, including SDK version per project. How do I do that on VS Code? Uh, you can associate an SDK version for a workspace. So if you have projects that need different SDK versions, you need to split those into different workspaces and do that association there. Uh, 
another question, can the Memory Explorer write to external flash? Well, with the Memory Explorer, you can't write to, to flash, whether it's internal or, or external. It has to do with, with the way that uh, flash technology works. So in RAM, it's random access memory. You can you know, write you know, ones and zeros anywhere you want. Uh, but with flash, the default state is that all the bits are one. So if you if you'd read uh, a blank flash, you would see all FF uh, in hexadecimal. Uh, and you can write bits from, from one to zero. Then if you want to flip them back to one, you need to erase an entire flash page. So of course, with the memory explorer, we can't do that. That's why you would need to use the, the flash drivers or some of the um, other abstractions for writing uh, into, into flash. That can also handle the erasing and also doing things like um, uh, spreading the, the, the writes and the, 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 the cycle so that you don't wear the same page too many times. You actually allocate a number of pages and you try to use that capacity uh, to write uh, data. Another question is, uh, I have some doubts whether the Wi-Fi module has its own memory where I can flash its code, or does the host take care of Wi-Fi chip working by controlling it? So yes, the, the NRF 7002, it's a companion chip. So it's a Wi-Fi companion chip. You can't run your application. It's not an SOC like the NRF uh, 52 or 53 or the 91. Uh, so you need a host device. So you can take the NRF 52840 or the NRF 5340 and uh, put the NRF 7002 next to that. So the lower layers of the stack, so the, the, you know, the physical level and the Mac level will, will run on the uh, 7002, and then the upper parts of the stack will run on the, on the host device. Uh, and then someone asking for details on flashing Wi-Fi applications using Segar Embedded Studio. Um, so with, um, with the NRF Connect SDK 2.0, Point zero, we actually discontinued support for Segar Embedded Studio, which used to be the default uh, IDE, uh, and we introduced support for, for VS Code. So officially, we don't support Segar Embedded Studio anymore. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't use it, but we just won't provide official support for that. So VS Code and our extensions are the uh, official recommended IDE to work with the NRF Connect SDK. Uh, another question, thingy 91 is not recognized inside VS Code. So the reason is that the, the thingy platform, so the 91 and the 53, they don't have an onboard debugger. So that's why when you connect it, you won't see it recognized on, on VS Code. Uh, but if you take um, a kit like the NRF 9160DK or any other kit, and you um, configure that debug out and connect that uh, to the debug port on the thingy, uh, or you can also use an external JLink adapter if you have one, then it will recognize uh, thing in one and VS Code. Uh, another question, support for software SIM on seller IoT applications. Is that eSIM or iSIM? It's actually neither of those. This is purely a software-based implementation. So the only thing that it relies on, on the target having a, a mechanism to isolate the, the system from the application code. So in the NRF 91, uh, 9160, 61, and 31, um, this is achieved through a trust tone. On, on the application core. So it's a pure software implementation. It is not eSIM, it's not iSIM either. Um, I'll continue with the questions, but let me uh, close the poll and throw another one. How would you rate the webinar demos? And the ratings are uh, the same. So one being worse than five being best. So let's continue with the answers. Uh, Dev Academy, matter course anytime soon. Not uh, not anytime soon. Uh, probably coming sometime, but uh, yeah, not the plans. So not something we we, we want to make any commitments there. So uh, this is uh, something we're looking at. Then the NRF twenty one five four zero chip passed one eighty dBm output. Is that power inside transmitting specs in EE? I think this might be a typo, and probably the question is uh, transmission specs in EU. So so CE regulations. Um, and then the answer is no, you can do 20 dBm uh, in, um, in North America, um, but not in, in EU, uh, at least not for Bluetooth LE. You can only do 10 dBm and you can do up to about somewhere between 13 and 14 dBm for uh, 802.15.4. So that's the uh, file layer for, for Thread and, and Zigbee. Then which VS Code extension should we be using uh, to show up in the marketplace? Uh, the extension pack and then just the, the extension. Uh, so there's actually four extensions uh, that, that you need to install. The extension pack installs all four of them. So that's the easiest way to get them. You have the NRF Connect for VS Code. So that gives you, you know, NRF debug, 
um, the ability to manage as the new features that are presented, uh, the ability to manage SDK toolchain version, um, the um, so the in the NRF debug that's where you get the memory um, memory explorer uh, as well as the uh, the thread viewer, and then you have the uh, NRF uh, K config. So that gives you a also a a GUI to explore the K config, so the configurations in your project. And then you have NRF device tree, which is a separate extension. And the last one is the NRF terminal. So if you use the extension pack, you get all four of those. Uh, then there's a question that I'm not sure what to answer. Uh, does it facilitate developing Bluetooth beacon marketing for retail and shopping? Uh, this might have been in context of some section of the webinar, but I'm not quite sure. So maybe there's something you, uh, you can follow up on. on on that zone. Then some interesting questions on the PMIC. Uh, the first one is, is state of charge estimate based on battery voltage and the lockup table, or is it based on cool of counting? So first thing is that uh, I recommend that you go watch the NPM 1300 webinar. It's explained uh, there how it's done, but in, in a nutshell, it's neither of those. So we have a developed a fuel cage algorithm that takes in uh, data that's already being uh, taken by the PMIC. So that will be the battery voltage. It's also measuring the current that goes in or out of the battery, and it's taking the battery temperature. So those three data points are fed into our, our fuel gauge algorithm, and that's how we get the state of charge calculation with an accuracy that matches Coulomb counting without requiring the energy that's associated with using Coulomb counting as a method uh, to, uh, to calculate state of charge. Uh, but more details on the webinar, so I recommend that you go and watch that one. Uh, and then another one on the PMIC, how long does the battery profiling take scaled by uh, capacity? So this takes about two days per temperature. And we, we recommend that you profile at three temperature points. So a low temperature point, something around zero degrees, for example, a nominal. So this would be you know room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, and then high, something like you know, 50, 50 degrees Celsius, for example. So two days at three data, at three temperature points will give a total of six days. And then the discharge current is proportional to the capacity. So it will, it will take the same time regardless of the capacity of your battery up to uh, 3,600 uh, milliamp hour. So if you're not familiar with, with battery profiling, this might sound long. However, if you compare with competition, uh, typically you would need to ship your battery to a third party for profiling. So what we tried to do at Nordic is provide the tools to developers to be able to do some of these things themselves and save all that hassle of shipping things around the world and all the you know the carbon impact that that comes with that as well. Um, and then regarding using matter on NRF52 with Apple and Google ecosystems, our NRF52840 DK with the NRF Connect SDK won't register as a Velolite switch matter device on Apple Pod or Google Nest. Uh, have we got this working? Uh, we do have this working. Uh, we have a you know matter setup demo that we we, we carry to trade shows, and and it, it supports both Apple and Google ecosystem. Uh, so we have a uh, a DevZone blog that talks about this, and I'll I'll put this to the chat. Um, it's in the chat now. So I recommend that that you give that one a read, and if if for some reason you still don't get it to work. Uh, then you know DevZone will be the place to to um, uh, submit a support request and and see uh, get some help from our tech support team to to get you through these uh, through these uh, hurdles. Uh, okay, I'm going to now close the second poll. Thanks for thanks for the answers. A uh, few more questions came in. Let me check. Uh, any news on distance measurement library? Uh, no updates. It's still experimental status. Um, so that's, that's I guess, the only thing I have to share at this point. And then uh, can NPM power up read configuration back into the GUI from an existing overlay file to make changes? Uh, that's a good question. I know you can import, but I think that's a different data format. So this is something I would need to try before I would give you a 100% um, uh, accurate answer. So it, might work, but I'm not sure if that, that's from the overlay file or if you need to save it to a different file format that can actually be imported. Um, will we have any code samples for NRF 7002 on Sager, or do we need to use VS Code? Yeah, so you need to use, well, I mean, the samples are in the SDK, right? It's not about the, the, 
ID, it's about uh, the SDK. Uh, and officially, we support VS Code. Um, what was, oh yeah, so there was one, oh, as soon as I missed this one. Um, version 2.5.0 has support for Linux, Ubuntu 22.04 LTS tier three. Any plans for supporting Linux, Ubuntu 22.4 LTS tier one? I'm actually not sure about this. This is a bit of a roadmap question, so that's something I can uh, address here. And then, uh, can I bridge a smart Wi-Fi light and control it over matter, even though the specification, my specification the light bulb doesn't seem to support matter. Um, so yeah, no, actually that would require a, a matter bridge within a Wi-Fi access point that would understand the application layer of this particular bulb, which does support matter and then have that translation scheme done to matter. So the, the matter bridge, the way it works that, for example, if you have a matter to Zigbee bridge, it, it understands the, um, the meaning of the, the Zigbee clusters on the Zigbee side and translates that to the, the matter uh, models on the matter side. Um, is matter useful for transmitting time series data though the matter network or through the matter network or is it only good for smart high applications? Um, I mean, currently uh, the focus of matter is on smart home devices. Um, if you look for matter 1.1, there were a few new device apps introduced, uh, but all within the smart home. Uh, for custom devices, I'm not exactly sure how you'd get this to work. Um, might be possible, but that's definitely not the focus of matter at this point. Okay, I think that was the last uh, question. Let me see if I missed anything. I don't think so. So if there are no more questions coming, um, thanks everyone for joining. Really appreciate uh, all the questions that, that you sent over. And I hope to see you again on the next uh, NRF Connect SDK webinar. Have a good morning, evening, where you are. And um, we'll see you next time. Thanks.